Let's dive into all this today. We'll be talking about Bitcoin mostly, a handful of other projects out there, but I do want to get into our sponsor, and that is Luxalgo. If you guys are looking to get into trading and really amping up your skills, enhance your trading experience through Luxalgo. This is one of the tool sets that we use in terms of indicators on the charts. So make sure and check the uh, link out down below. It's one of the best places to go for uh, getting your trading indicators. Now, one of the things that we do when we're looking at Lux Luxalgo, and I kind of tra track this against what's happening also with sentiment. Some of the things that we look at, here's Bitcoin, of course, after the FOMC, uh, we've seen a little bit of a dip right there on the daily. But you can kind of see the amount of money that's been flowing out over the last couple of weeks, people taking profits, moving back down, and then we did see a little bit of money flow coming into Bitcoin here slightly just early this week. Also still in the green though. So we are back at 43K on Bitcoin. If you look at some of the sentiment factors that we've been looking at, one thing that I'm, I'm a little concerned with Bitcoin right now, the last time we saw up, up an upside trend on sentiment, we started to see a downtrend on the uh, amplification sentiment. And what happened when that occurred was when we saw Bitcoin starting to recorrect, which it has just recently started to correct, but we're already seeing a little bit of a separation here. So is this maybe an early signal of maybe Bitcoin coming back down under 42K? So we're gonna be watching that very closely. Let's get into a few things I wanna lead off right here with Justin. Spot Bitcoin ETFs hold 3.3% of current Bitcoin supply. This is massive. And again, this also goes back to our point is that is the ETF really drawing in new money or are we starting to see new ways in which the market is really just shuffling around in terms of where exposure is being done? Grayscale comes in and says, hey, wait a minute. Grayscale crypto sector framework is not just about Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's also about the entirety of an asset class that is being developed. I would agree with that to a certain extent, is that there is an asset class that is being developed right now. We have the 12 sector, it's here, crypto. And I think the question is, when does Main Street really start to move into the market? Another thing I wanted to hit on right here was this tweet, and it's uh, talking about Black BlackRock now controlling 63,488 Bitcoin. This is up another 6,000 plus um, Bitcoin from yesterday, massive increase. 900 Bitcoin issued per day. Soon this will drop to 450. You see the weight difference there, guys? We're talking about, this is the amount that the miners are producing. We're about to see that drop in half in May and BlackRock is soaking up 6,000 Bitcoins a day. That's, uh, that's insane. So that believes one thing. We're gonna see an all-time high with Bitcoin. It, does it happen 2024? This is the question mark right now because you still have pressure coming in from the Fed. The Fed continues to put a lot of negative pressure. And I think after the FOMC meeting yesterday, we had all this discussion within the crypto pit. We've seen analyst after analyst kind of look at this both on a positive note and on a negative note. I'm a little bit more on the hawkish note. Here's why. There's a couple of things that have happened. And he really talked about this whole data collection process. I showed a lot of data on the chart yesterday in the video. If you didn't catch that, go back and watch our FOMC meeting. But mainly what I was showing is that we have seen down cycles on inflation. Now, granted, yes, there is a bit of a risk if we do see upside. The problem that I think the market is not going to allow that is all around these job losses that we've seen just really in the last 60 days. Remember, job cuts going into the holidays, not so much. After the beginning of the year, that's when companies, corporations, will start making their adjustments. And that's actually what has started to happen. We've started to see job cut after job cut. And I think it's only the beginning moving into some of the markets and especially earning seasons that we'll start to see in Q1. I think we'll see another major round of job cuts either in March prior to earnings so they can soften the blow and or in April so they can adjust for the next quarter. So there's some things happening. Remember timing here, all in line with this. So rate cuts are really the big question here. If you look at what Powell said here, a couple of points, pointed out that it was premature for the Red, uh, Fed to start interest cuts in March. So that's the negative point of it. We all know inflation will fall. However, we, you know, for now, we think there will be a pause in the rate uh, of inflation in, in decline. So he thinks we're gonna stall a little bit. I think at this point, he's right. I don't agree with him often. I think we are going to stall a little bit in terms of inflation which is gonna push the rate cuts into later in the year. 
Now, what does that mean for Bitcoin? Could be good because we are potentially going to see maybe a softer February on Bitcoin after a pretty raucous you know, situation at the end of last year and even with the start of this year. But uh, the Fed, you know, long, high long-term interest rate strategy carries negative risk for future growth. This is still a problem going forward, which is also another negative connotation to the markets. And then Bloomberg economics economists continue to think there will be an interest rate cut in March. I disagree. I don't think we get one in March. I think there's too many things in the way for them to actually see a rate cut, unless there is a massive impact on inflation. If we see a significant three to four point drop in inflation, okay, maybe so. I just don't see that happening though, unless it, because the labor market just now starting to ramp up in the sense of job cuts. Um, and they, they even talk about it, that they think the softening of the labor market and inflation is weakening the labor market. We're going to see more layoffs. Yeah, I would agree with that. Goldman Sachs says that after Powell's negative statements, they posted a, their forecast for the Fed's interest rate cuts from March to May. So they're kind of going back to the point, I think, which is a little bit later in the year. May could be the, the date. That is a very good possibility. Obviously, timing here with Bitcoin having, yeah, for sure. Here, of course, is macro alpha committee does not expect the appropriate reduction in target range till the gain is greater confidence around inflation, moving sustainability uh, toward 2% sustainably sort two percent that's the problem mark because if we see a flat line even though we're losing jobs and we're not seeing massive correction in inflation those are both bad things for the economy that's consumer confidence that means s p will start to take a little bit of a structure uh, and also we'll start to see some pullback possibly into cash again that's the worst thing that can happen for crypto so those are the things that we're watching very closely here was another uh, point right here. Big thoughts on, on uh, the FOMC. Big picture, dovish. I would agree with that. Small picture, hawkish. You know, uh, Jay Powell says no cuts in March, tamper animal spirits, but the Fed turning dovish will start cutting either in May or June. I'm in agreement with this. I still feel like that's going to happen. But again, there's only one thing that will change that for March, and that is a major CPI hit in our next two reports. That's the question mark going forward. Here's GR Dector, layoff announcements, 80,000 in the U.S. in January. Uh, this is the most in 10 months. Something we've talked about here on the show for quite a, a while is that job cuts are coming. Well, they're here. 136% per in, percent increase from December. What I said earlier, nobody lays off in the holiday season or not anybody with a heart. And come January, that's when everybody starts their cuts. And then U.S. PayPal or UPS PayPal, Microsoft, Google, all big layoffs. And remember, media. We've seen Sports Illustrated, Business Insider, among many others, start to take hits and actually close down. So this is happening in all sectors. It's not just tech. And it's definitely, uh, I think, going to start hitting Main Street. And that's when it gets serious, is when it starts to hit Main Street. I want to go to a clip here. This is Big Tech uh, founder uh, that was talking about tech layoffs in general. Some of these mid-level kind of Google engineers are shaking free. This might open up some opportunity to listen to what he had to say. Well, versed in the non-AI, old school technologies, are they finding peers that are, are getting laid off here? You mentioned that they're sort of more well-versed in the non-AI, old school technologies. Are they finding places in other companies? What's the demand for those workers? And, and, and the manager is probably even tougher, right? Yeah, absolutely. Look, if, if you are hiring in this environment, you spent the last five years in the zero interest rate world trying to poach from Google and you've been unsuccessful. Now some of those mid-level Google engineers are shaking free. This is your dream. So you just need to hold your hand up in this job environment if you're a former Google engineer and you're going to get offers. Now there are some companies that are going to be a little bit reticent because Google has been viewed by the tech world as a summer camp where you don't have to do much. And it might be a shock for those people within Google to go find new employment. But that being said, you know, this is a, a job seekers market, right? So I have a, a couple of things on that, you know, and my background in, in running devs for a long period of time. First of all, someone coming from a Google job going to an entry level or even mid-market job is uh, not likely because the amount of the salary disportion that you've got of a Google paid engineer versus them going into a mid-tier market. Secondly, is that VC money has already started to slow in the market for advancing businesses, money is much harder. And then you have high cost of capital. So where would they get the money to pay for that Google engineer? So I think that's BS. That's just not something that's gonna happen. Those jobs are gonna be lost. 
and that will hit the bottom line of the American economy because that's the kind of jobs that we don't want to see lost because they contribute so much to a typical economy. They are usually the affluent. Here's a further clip. This was Squawk Box talking about strong motivation to be swayed by politics, uh, et cetera, uh, around the election. Let's listen in. As you get closer to an election, there is this view, obviously, that that maybe it gets harder for them to even touch rates. It's not about lowering rates or increasing rates. It's about doing anything with rates. And and I wonder, as as we do get closer, whether you think that that little birdie gets louder. Uh, so when you asked me the other day, I was very yeah. clear that that's not an explicit part of the conversation. As right. I said, I can't speak to what's in people's heads. I do think, really, we have to recognize that you know, the, the chair, the historic chair of the Fed that was most criticized was Arthur Burns, because he was thought to be too political. Um, and so, yeah, you know, there's a strong, strong motivation to not be seen to be swayed by, you know, politics one way or the other. Um, and look, if the data come in saying they need to move close to the election, they would be unwise to delay, because then they will have a more difficult situation on their hands, you know, having to try to move more quickly after it. Um, and so I think they are going to follow the data, as Powell said. Um, and if you know, one of those moves is very close to the election, my advice to them would be to go in and take the move, because the failure to move on the right time can have uh, negative repercussions later. Yeah, I, I would agree with that in the sense that if, you know, politically, this is a little bit of a tricky tightrope that Powell has to walk. Not that there, and first of all, this is political, always will be. The Fed is going to be in an interesting position because it is an election year. We haven't seen these kind of cycles land in election years before, not often, all the way back, I think, to 2008. But if you look at a couple of things that he stated here in the sense of if, the, if let's say, that we do get pressure, more job loss, and a slowing inflation drop, meaning we're not getting near the 2%, that does put some high pressure well, I would say sell pressure on the Fed to say, okay, we got to go ahead. We're losing jobs. We've got to lower the interest rate, the Fed fund rate, because we got to loosen up capital because capital will, of course, inject in the economy, maybe get into jobs, but it's not going to help affect the actual situation of the economy. And that's the one that I think they're between a rock and a hard place. I think it might be too late as a political ploy going forward this year. Remember, we're in now February and we have an election in November. That means really October is our no go, no go date. And there's just not enough time in between this. So it's gonna be a very, very interesting summer. How do they spend this is the question. Both sides, GOP and the Dems will be a question marker. 84% of crypto investors now foresee Bitcoin's new bull run highs. Uh, I would agree. I think we are gonna see Bitcoin make it to a new high. Is it a 24 high or is it a 25 high? I think everything right now depends on where the Fed pivots. And jobs are going to be the thing I'm watching most. Because if they continue to see the kind of cuts we've seen just in the first 30 days of the year, then I think, yes, we might have a reason for a potential pivot in May uh, or possibly June. A couple of points they made in this. This was the report. They revealed that 70% of investors plan to increase their crypto allocations, 24. They know it's coming. Devaluation of the American dollar. We understand that. Anticipating a bull run triggered by this event, 84% also say that uh, nine, almost 10,000 participants expecting Bitcoin to pass its previous high at 69K. Do you guys think that? Do you think we are in that kind of cycle where we would see the continuation of a new all-time high in you know, a potential of... Maybe another 60 to 70% of that. Would love to get you guys' thoughts on that. I'm still a little bit questioned as to whether or not we'll see that with Bitcoin this time around. Majority of investors, 55%, predict Bitcoin's price stabilized between 50 and 100. Significant portion sees it soaring above 150. That would be pretty significant right now, considering Bitcoin is hovering around 43K. So a nice 3X move for all of you guys out there. Further into this, I'll end with this clip. This is Squawk Box talking about really kind of the future of IPOs and why this might be an important to crypto. I'll explain right after this clip. Listen in. IPOs and, you know, we're seeing a fairly stable rate outlook at this point. I talked to M&A bankers who say the pipeline actually looks really good, not just for M&A, but also for IPOs. As a wealth reporter, I like to see liquidity events, and we just didn't have many last year or the year before. What does that pipeline look, look to you? And 
Is it surprising that we're not really seeing much activity yet? It's obviously still January. Uh, but what does the sort of second, third quarter look like? Well, we actually, I would say we're off to a slightly better start this year than last year even. But we are seeing uh, a lot more interest in coming public this year. We have 85 companies on file to list on NASDAQ, assuming that the markets um, are receptive. And as you know, you know, investors need to have a pretty good understanding of what the future looks like in order for them to underwrite risk. And I would agree with you, you know, a more normalized uh, inflationary environment and so therefore the cost of doing business is more known. And now you know that the cost of capital isn't going to go up and there's potential it comes down. You know, that gives them more confidence too. So our view is that the markets will be hopefully a lot more receptive. Seeing the, you know, the economy see robust in the process, I think that we'll see a much more inviting IPO environment. Are there year. any big names out there that you can mention that we might look out for in the next six to nine months? Well, we don't actually specifically talk about yeah. names, but I would say we have this new IPO pulse index that we created that tries to provide you a leading indicator as to what the IPO environment is likely to look like. And it is indicating over the next six months that we should be able to see a, a real pickup in IPOs. And all right. So some good things there in the sense that, you know, uh, companies going public, I think it's bec between a rock and a hard place, meaning they're trying to get it done before we could see a potential major correction in the market and possibly a hard landing. That's one factor. The advantage is, is that there's going to be a lot of people out of work. And for an IPO, you're going to need job growth. Job growth is usually what gets stimulated when an IPO happens because they need to hire a lot of people. So that's one advantage is that they'll have a market uh, to really go out there and get a job pool that is available, whether it's engineers from Google or other tech companies that could fall into this. Remember, Circle's going into an IPO. So it is really kind of a rock and a hard place. Get it done. Labor is in a position where we might be able to benefit from it, but the market may be in a more difficult position where we may not be able to benefit it from it when it comes to actual participation in these IPOs. So it's gonna be interesting to see how all this plays out. That's for sure. We got a lot happening right now in early 2024 as we record this. Of course, if you guys are not in the Diamond Circle, make sure and get in because it's another place where we drop additional podcasts and more research, additional insights that we don't put here on YouTube. So it's really easy. And of course, catch me out there on X at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.